apparently can only do that without having a pitch having the video and uh, I was wondering uh, no she's doing it from a landline from her telephone oh I, oh I didn't realize you could get on this thing on a landline oh yeah 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 she don't oh, even... so she that's the reason she doesn't have I thought that she was having a problem getting the uh, getting an app or whatever for the video part no i think that um she just has a, a landline and uh I, I i'm i'm gonna you know she'll get comfortable and figure out if she wants to try to do that it's just a matter of downloading the software you know she has to have the app either on her phone or her pc i think she had said she had a smartphone but she just couldn't figure the app out but we'll see oh she'll uh you know. Yeah, I didn't realize that. I know that uh, I forget the name of the company. Webex. Yeah, Webex. Uh, they can do it on a telephone. I knew that, but I didn't realize this one could. Oh yeah, this goes on uh, any number of ways. It's just basically a conference call when you do it that way. Well, that's good, really. That way, I mean, it doesn't exclude anybody. You know, if they want to yeah. at least listen or whatever. Yeah, I had some people that were doing it while they were, because they worked and they were driving home and they were listening to it on the phone in their car, you know, just have it on the phone without having to look at it. You could just dial in. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so, but we um, definitely have a, uh, some controversies out there with some of these people that are upset about the election. Yeah, you know, I stayed up to one o'clock in the morning and I just thought, man, I'm too tired. I got to go to bed. So I went to sleep and I think I read later that they, it was about two, two something or whatever when they did finally made the decision. Yeah, but was, you know what? It was it was close. It, it's it's actually it was a repeat. It was a repeat of Bush and Gore, without the Chads and without the court. Yeah, pretty close. I looked up. I looked it up. I looked it up because I was curious. <laughs> and um, the popular the, vote. The popular and, vote for Bush and Gore was five hundred and forty something thousand. The separation. And, and as of this evening, a few more will be added on either side, but as of this evening, it's about 200 and something, a little over 200,000 separation in this one, which makes it, at this point, closer than that one was back then. So when we were talking about that a while back, and I know y'all thought it would be a blowout, it's not that I'm so smart, but I've been, I've been following this for a year, and I'm actually fed up with it. I've got too much of it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, really. Because I'd already told you, I wasn't for either one of them. If Hillary Clinton would have won, I would have felt just like I felt with Trump. In other words, I didn't, I almost didn't vote, which I know you shouldn't, and I'm not big on people that don't vote, but I almost took that route because I just thought, man, I was going to pull the Jesus, didn't get involved in politics. See, that was going to be my defense. <laughs> yeah, sure. But anyhow, um, it's really our nation as far as all that stuff political and you know the other thing of course i've mentioned before um, politics is very much like religion in the sense in the sense that you got one person on one side of the fence and because people in religion they're always arguing over points of the law you know how that goes with religious people no that isn't can't be blah blah or not well, that's the way politics, that's the way it's become. I shouldn't say it's always been. That. Our country has become that way. You got a certain group over here, and really, I don't like that. And I don't know if anybody likes it. I, and except, I don't know how to explain how I feel about it, but I don't have, I don't have any doubt that God doesn't look at this stuff like we do. <laughs> I have no doubt about that. I yeah. can't tell you that I know exactly how he looks at it. But I'm just saying that he didn't, Jesus did not like religion, and that's why I compare politics to religion. That you got, uh, and I'm not saying everybody that's voting is that way, but there's a core group that's narrow minded on this side and narrow minded on that side. 
And I, so anyhow, you know, I can get into all these discussions just like I'm sure you can. But it, it, it is closer than that one back then. And there was a lot of, you know, they figured that was a great division back in 2000, you know. Yeah. And so I just see our country in such a, you know, but we'll just have to see how it pans out. And um, I don't know. I'm getting older, you know. I, how old are you, Kurt? 54. Well, 10 years difference. That's not a whole lot, but I'm 64. I just turned it this summer. Congratulations. Who know, you, know, you never know how long you're going to live. So I don't know how much more of this, the political thing and how our country goes politically, you know, how much more I'll see. I mean, I might see a lot more. It's, there's no real prediction on when we're going to leave the earth, you know. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. I hope, to, I hope to see that there's somehow, I don't know. I don't really know. That's why I really look at that lady I mentioned that I knew that she didn't vote because she said, Jesus didn't get involved in politics. Um, I, I don't have no problem with that myself. I don't go and criticize in my mind people like that uh, because God is not, um, he doesn't think like that. Now, we, we don't know everything, but I know in my relationship with God, he doesn't look and separate. In fact, you know, it talks about that there's not a Jew or Gentile. There's not this and that. You know, there's no separation. And, and I'm just saying it's it's almost like a, a um, oh, I don't know. Sometimes I don't have an exact word in my mind for something. But the whole idea of what I feel in me, and a lot of people feel it, I'm quite sure. Like a lot of people want peace on the earth. They they real strong. They wish there's peace on the earth. And, I, and I'm kind of bringing that in here as an example that with all this stuff, unity in the nation, it's kind of like peace on the earth as far as really to have all this, everybody's got to be in tune with God, which as far as I know, before I leave the earth, it's not going to happen. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, so I, anyhow, just, uh, I, I do a lot of my looking through the, through yeah. the eyes of uh, spiritual stuff, and I don't like to over-spiritualize stuff, but uh, anyhow... I think that there is absolutely a um, a place for um, all the things of the world because you know Jesus wasn't uh, when Jesus ministered. Okay, he he dealt with politics because he dealt with religion because the the Pharisees and and that was the organized political you know, figures in the time. And those were actually the Herodians. He, yeah. dealt with, uh, he dealt with politics in a big way. So I think that there is a, absolutely a place that we have to, um, you know, we have a certain amount, I believe, of responsibility to things that we know. And I think that just the idea of, apologetic just the idea of us discipling and apostolizing i think in and of itself is a is a movement to um bring and save people to an awareness of god which will lead them down a life which they will need guidance in how to deal with the world and, you know, Jesus gave us examples of how we are not <coughs> of this world, but we are in this world. Right. And, and that was the idea that he had. And so we, you know, there's a certain amount of responsibility that, you know, we can't just, you know, and even in Corinthians, it talks a lot about, you know, look, you guys uh, allowing people to carry on in the church, in a way that's not really representative of godly ways. And, you know, for this, I have a problem. Yeah. And, and, and there's certain disciplines. So just like there's disciplines that way, well, then, you know, consequentially, there's, there's disciplines the opposite way, too. And so I think to educate people and disciple people and be an apostle in the world or disciple in the world has to include the things of the how to deal with the things of the world 
So I don't know that, you know, we could go off on that, but I think yeah. right, now, right now there's a lot of, you know, there, there was always a lot of division here. Oh, yeah. It's not like it's all of a sudden since Trump was elected. It's just we're seeing a different color or a different view or a different level of it now. Yeah, yeah well, no, that's what I'm saying. Back in 2000, it's just a repeat except the Chad, as far as the division, except the Chad's and the court. In other words, yeah. It, it's it, the country's been that way for quite a number of years. So I wasn't saying this was. That's why I was mentioning the year two thousand. Right, Denise. Hi. Hi. How are you? <laughs> blessed. 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 Mm, very good. Praise God, everyone. Praise God. Amen. We're gonna go Amen. ahead and kick it off here. Just wanted to say hello. And um, Amen. We, we get carried on here sometimes a little too long talking, but we're it's eight minutes after, so we're going to get started. Amen. I just had a thought on that, uh, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For he that loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Set your affections on things above and not on things of the earth. He said, come out up from among them and be ye separate. <laughs> in Correct. the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, that's how our hearts need to be. And Hallelujah. And at the same token, <laughs> mm -hmm. because we got to be rapture ready and we got to be able to leave everything behind us, everything on this earth. We got to be able to drop it off, just drop it, you know, and That's not right. be attached to anything, you it's know, like anything on this earth. Amen. Yeah. I believe it's like a soldier, like a combat veteran. Um, <laughs> Andrew, I took like a combat, like a, like a GI. A general issue. We're here functioning, but you know we're soldiers for the army of the Lord, and at any moment we can be called or you know be called no, out. You can hear that blast, yeah. Ratchet out, and and if that's the case, whatever we're dealing with, whether it's a civilian life or a house, with whatever that is, it's got to go. We're gone with that. It's all over. We leave, and um, I, I get that, but. As we are the light of the world, as we are here as a witness, and as we are to occupy and influence, there, there's the standard that we use for our spirit and our mind of Christ and for those things that we need to fundamentally have foundation for our thought process I agree. It wholeheartedly needs to be that of spirit. But that, and, and Jesus makes these points real clear, like he did with Nicodemus. He said, that which is spirit is spirit, that which is flesh is flesh. And there is a carnal part. You know, God so loved the world. He did love the world. So the idea of the world is we do love the world. And God is also we understand that the world is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And as we have all of these things to contend with, I think a lot of times we as Christians get caught up a little bit into a place where that's, listen, if say for instance, we were living and I heard a comment today on Facebook and I might as well just take a minute to express this because I wasn't going to get into this, but might as well. <laughs> The the um, if you're in China and you have um, a, an oppressed religious or spiritual even um, life, mm -hmm. there's still huge revival going on in China. There's still a huge number of people being turned on to the Lord in all parts of the world. So it doesn't prevent it. It won't prevent it. But the thing is that if we have an opportunity in this country to have a freedom that I believe was established based on the principles that um, God would like us to see as we take and occupy and influence the world, I really do, because all of the principles that we use to, to follow a godly nation are biblical principles. And I'm talking about the, 
the principles of the Bible and principles of Jesus, not just any God. I'm talking about the God of Jesus, Abraham, Isaac, you know, Jacob, that God. So if that's the case, if that's the case, and we have the opportunity to vote for either or, and when I say either or, you never, we don't have a perfect separation there. The line is very foggy. I'm not saying that Trump is Jesus. I'm not saying that Hillary was Jesus either, or Satan for that matter, neither either or. But it's our obligation to follow where we are with our brothers and sisters in Christ, a promotion or a, a standard that is set and established on the same principles of what we believe. I don't think we should be pushing a narrative that is against Christianity, against or for abortion, or for, you know, different principles that are not biblically supported or founded, because that's not what the country was established on either. Well, so, in the end, the Lord is going to have his way. He said, avoid discussions about spiritual pedigrees and things of like, and don't argue over words and, you know, discussions, you know, don't debate and things like that. That's all in the Bible. So I try to stay away from that and just try to stay on what the Lord is planning for his return because he has called us to a ministry of reconciliation. He didn't say he called us to the ministry of the judgment. We are to judge those in the church. You know, he said we'll even judge uh, the angels. But as far as this stuff that's going on here, don't concern yourself much about it. Just go on with what he's telling us to do and let's get people ready to be raptured ready. That's Amen. what what I was told to do. Well, I mean, what my instruction was, it was like, hey, hey, do not concern yourself with this. This is going to, because the end time has to come. His will has to be done. He's going to do that revelation thing. And whoever's going to be left behind, they're going to be left behind. And they're going to go through the tribulation period and things of that nature. That's more of what I'm talking about because I got some loved ones who has rejected and are going to be left behind if they don't change into the tribulation period. And I'm wondering, what do I do? Do I leave them a, a um, like a cabinet or something with some food or something? Because you're not going to be able to sell it by without this mark. So that's more like what I'm talking about. Not so much as what Trump and Hillary done because they're leading up into the tribulation period. We got to we got to get there and we're going to the church is going to be raptured out of here, but there are going to be people left behind. Yes. So, yes. so that's yes. my thing. I'm like, well, what do I do about the loved ones that I love? Because he says once we get there, once we're raptured out of here, uh, the former things will be no more. So we won't even remember our loved ones. So why I yet remember them? I want someplace prepared where I can say, well, hey, if something happens, you know, any God forbid, but. Just in case, you know, you can always have my house, you know, just come here. Everything is there. There's a uh, pantry full of stuff. But I never hear preachers or teachers talk about what do we do with those loved ones that we love now? Because once we're gone, we won't remember them no more. That's why there'll be no more crying, no more sighing, no more dying, no more fear. Right. It'll be just joy. But no one talks about that. They want to talk about this right now. And I'm like, okay, let's forget right now. Let's think about our loved ones that are going to be left behind. And all this stuff is really going to melt with the fervent breath of his coming. So I don't know how I would be able to leave them anything because mm -hmm. everything is going to melt. Everything people believed in and everything people loved and their cars and their jewelry and their minks or their big Trump towers or whatever. All that stuff is going to melt with the breath of his coming. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, <laughs> that's mm -hmm. what the Bible says. Well, no. uh, the thing the thing about it is that I think God does call people to do different things, obviously. So apparently that's what he's called for you. But there might be other people that might be, you know, could be called different in a different way, though, you know. Possibly. That's true. That's true. So I've had um, now in, in this, especially during these times, the, the, these are, you know, and this subject of end times is a huge subject and I look at it in so many different ways. I've been exposed to it in, by so many different people in so many different ways. 
And I think one of the things that I started to recognize was that rightly discerning the brethren, rightly discerning the body. I'm talking about the body of Christ. The body, that the head doesn't say to the foot, I have no need of these. How would the eye, if we were all eyes, how would we hear? If we were all ears, how would we see? You know, this whole situation of the body of Christ, I do believe absolutely positively that there are people called for separate or distinct um, um, positions during the end times. I really do. And, and I've listened to people who are focused on their position and preparing property, preparing food, preparing storing up of, of uh, this, 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 who is the, the fella that um, now sells a lot of this um, food online with the um, TBN. He, he was, um, he was part of a big, huge ministry that crumbled when he was found doing some discrescencies with women and got caught with it. I can't remember his name, but he's... Oh, he's uh, used to be a real popular preacher. Yeah, I have no idea. Um, I, I forgot his I name. I know who you're talking about. I can't think of his name. But he sells, I mean, bales and bales and piles and piles of food for store it up for mm -hmm. end times. I mean, that, that... But all this all this is melt with the fervent breath of his coming. So to store well, well, up anything is just... It's, just not I, even real. I, I believe it. I, I believe what you're saying in that case. But I do think, though, that perhaps if it's only for a moment or whatever it might be, that this is necessary. There, there is some plan that's probably way beyond the scope of what I can understand that may entail such a need. If the spirit is leading the person in that direction and they have a full knowledge and they're aware and, and I believe that they're ordained in that manner and they can move in that direction and they're called to it and they're anointed and you can see fruit from what they're doing. God bless them is what I say. You know, I, and again, I may not understand and I may not have to agree, but I can definitely see where there is different things going on that maybe not all of it is going to be really unto my understanding so i really yeah. can't, i can't lean to it but, <laughs> but okay. i do say i do say now that what the holy spirit completely is nothing more than an edifier and i will say as we speak here and i was going to open up in prayer so we can move on past this because this could be a long night <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to say that you know the Lord has put on my heart to just open up to all the children of the Lord. And as we look at them and as we find them, that there is a road, you know, there is a road that is wide and, and there's a road that is narrow and that we are guided and led and called and, and summoning and exampling and witnessing to those who would be in that wide road to come to this compressed, narrow understanding of where it is that Jesus would have you walk, where he would send you and straighten your path and bring you to this narrow road. It's the road that leads to the Father. And the only way is through the Son. And we look at this and we find right now in our hearts that we'll hear a word of understanding and find that calling to which I, I know that God's led me to and fulfill that role and be that what God would have you to be, the fullness of it, so that it glorifies him and leads the lost in a way where they can be saved. It would be God's will that none should perish and we should see glory in the day to come as we prepare this bride for Christ, who is our Savior, who is bound coming from and back to us that we can rejoice and understand that. And again, this is where my heart is, and it's for the people, and it's for discipling, and it's for discernment, that they may reach out and understand and grab a word from the Lord. And as we sit here tonight, we're going to hear a word, understanding our spirit, our soul, and our body more closely and more intimately so that we can get a revelation that we can share with someone else to help them to achieve eternal life. Hallelujah. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I think it was Jimmy Swagger. Jimmy Swagger, that's who it is. You're right. 
All right, here we go. We're um, continuing with lesson number 18. My Lord, we're moving along. Applications of this teaching of spirit. But it's your spirit that gets saved and that your spirit is completely changed according to 2 Corinthians. Can everyone hear that okay? Verse 17. Yeah. One of the applications of that truth is that in the spirit realm, you have the mind of Christ. Now, the last couple of days I've been building up to this, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, it says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord that we may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Just by observation, you can tell that that's not talking about in your physical mind up here because you can look at your last test. You can, every one of us is just aware that we forget names, we forget things. But you know what? In the spirit realm is the only way to understand this. In the spirit, you have the mind of Christ. And before you can draw it out, you first of all have to understand that you know everything that God knows. Hmm. Boy, that is just, that's, to some people, I'm sure that that sounds like blasphemy. I'm not talking about with just my brain up here, I know this. I'm talking about the born again part of me. I have the spirit of Christ that has been sent into my heart. Galatians chapter four says, we've had the spirit of his son crying, Abba, Father. It says in Romans chapter eight, verse nine, that if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So if anybody says, well, how dare you say that you have the spirit of Christ in you? Well, Romans 8 9, if you don't have the spirit of Christ, you aren't born again. No, this is what happens. You become a new person, and God literally puts the spirit of Jesus on the inside of you. And one of the benefits of having Jesus live on the inside of you is that you know everything that Jesus knows. Your born-again spirit is identical to Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 says, He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. H-E-I-S is the Greek word, and it means one to the exclusion of another. It's not talking about similar, of the same kind. It's talking about identical. In your born-again spirit, you have the mind of Christ. Therefore, you have his wisdom, his ability, his understanding. Well, that's powerful. And if people understood that, it would change a lot of things. It would change a lot of the songs that we're singing about just woe is me. Nobody knows the trouble I feel, wailing and travailing about how tough this life is. And, oh, I just hope I can hold out until I get to heaven. You know what? Once you understand that everything that God is was in Jesus, the fullness of the Godhead was in him bodily, Colossians 2, 9, and we are now complete in him. I guarantee you Jesus isn't wringing his hands, looking at this world situation, wondering how he's going to make this work, and, and he's not worried, and he's not anxious about anything. Jesus is seated at the Father's right hand. He's already won. Everything is a done deal. It's all moving towards a conclusion that he's predicted, and it's going to come to pass. There is no anxiety, no worry, no care in Jesus' part. And in your born-again spirit, you have that same mind. Matter of fact, there's so many scriptures on this. You know, I'm just having to pick and choose. But over here in 1 uh, Peter chapter 4, I believe it is, it says... Uh, in verse 1, 1 Peter 4, 1, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself likewise with the same mind. And it goes on. But let me just stop right there and say that Jesus suffered all of these things for us. Everything that he suffered wasn't because of his sin, because of his failure. He bore our judgment, our punishment. He, everything that Jesus did was for us. And now, one of the benefits is that everything that Jesus is now is for us. It's not just going to take place when we die and go to be with the Lord. It's going to be completed when we get into heaven because our soul and our body will be changed, and therefore there will be no resistance. There will be nothing to stop the flow of what is true in our spirit. But right now, in your spirit, you have been totally changed, your born-again spirit is identical to Jesus. Your salvation in the spirit realm is as perfect, as pure, as complete right this moment as it'll be a million years from now in eternity. 
<laughs> one third of your salvation is over. And what I'm focusing on this week is that in that spirit realm, you now have the mind of Christ. Now, you don't have it up here in your head, but in your born again spirit, you have the mind of Christ. And it says right here, arm yourselves with that same mind. You can have the same thinking that Christ has. There's many scriptures that talk about this. It says in Colossians chapter 3, and in verse uh, 10, let me turn over and read that. Colossians chapter 3, and in verse 10, I'm breaking right into the middle of this teaching, but he says, and have put on the new man, this is again talking about the spirit part of you that's been born again, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that has created him. So this is saying that in that new man, in that spirit part of you, you are renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. It's saying that your knowledge is similar to his knowledge. Actually, it's even more than similar. If you look over in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 20, that scripture there uh, says, uh, but you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. Again, by observation, you can tell that this isn't talking about your brain. Your brain doesn't know all things. There's just all kinds of things that we do not understand with our mind. So the only thing that's left is this has to be talking about the mind of Christ that is in your born-again spirit. You know all things, all things, not most things, not a lot of things, not the important things, not the basic things that you have to survive to get by with. This scripture, 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, says that you know all things, period. That's it. And again, there are some people that if you haven't watched this whole series that I've done on Spirit, Soul, and Body, or even if you have watched it, but if it hasn't yet sunk in and really dominated you, some people are just by observation going to search their mind and say, well, I don't know all things. And so you just discount this. But this isn't talking about the physical, emotional, mental part of you. In the born-again spirit, when you get born again, God placed within you the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2, 16. Colossians 3, you have been renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created you. And then 1 John 2, 20 says you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. I know that some of you say, but I just can't see it. I can't grasp it. How can I believe it? You just take what you see in the Word. You know, going back to the very beginning of this teaching that I did, I told you that flesh is flesh and spirit is spirit, and you cannot discern what is going on in the spiritual part of you by any physical feeling. You can't see it, taste it, hear it, smell it, or feel it. You just have to look at the Word like a mirror. And you look at this as a spiritual mirror, and when it says something, you go by what it says. Because Jesus said in John 6, 3, that it, the flesh profits nothing. It's the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. God, Jesus said, my words are spirit. They are representative of what is true in the spiritual realm. This is how you perceive the spirit truth is through what the word says. And so I've given you a bunch of scriptures. 1 Corinthians 2.16, you have the mind of Christ. Colossians 3.10, that new man, the spirit, has been renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, you have an unction. That means a special endowment of power, special ability from God. And you know all things. This is true of you in your born-again spirit. In your spirit, you have the mind of Christ. You know everything that you need to know. Knowledge is power. You know, I've already used these verses, but over in 2 Peter chapter 1, it talks about all things. Verse 3, that pertain unto life and godliness are given unto us through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. And then verse 4 says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. The subject was talking about knowledge, and it says, whereby through this knowledge is given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. So the knowledge of God is contained in these promises, in the Word. The Word of God is revealed, and everything that you need comes through the knowledge of God. 
Somebody might say, well, I know that's true, but the problem is I just don't have any knowledge of God. What I'm trying to teach you is that in your born-again spirit, you have the mind of Christ. You've been renewed in knowledge after the image of Him that created you. You have a special anointing from God, and you know all things. He goes on and says this in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 27. It says, but the anointing which you've received of Him. Remember in verse 20, right up here, it says you have an unction from the Holy One. That's talking about a special anointing or an endowment of power, and you know all things. Verse 27, but the anointing, that unction, that endowment of power which you have received of him abides in you and you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things and is truth and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. Boy, that's awesome. You know what this is saying is that when you got born again, you have the mind of Christ, you know all things and you have the Holy Spirit to take this revelation that is on the inside of you and begin to educate your brain. You've got to get to where you understand with your mind the things that are already a reality in your born-again spirit. You know, you will often hear people say, well, I know that I know these things in my head, but I'm trying to get them down into my spirit. I've heard people before say, we're trying to educate our spirit. That really isn't the accurate way of looking at this. If you are born again in your spirit, your spirit has the mind of Christ, has an unction from the Holy One, it knows all things. It's been renewed in knowledge after the image of Him that created Him. In your spirit, everything is perfect. Your spirit knows the truth. You may be out there in your soulish, physical person just panicking and saying, what do I do? And wondering about what to do. But your spirit, if you've been born again, is calm, and it knows the answers. So you aren't trying to get the word out of your head and into your spirit. The truth is you are trying to take the revelation that has already been placed in your spirit when you got born again and you have the mind of Christ, and you are trying to draw that wisdom out and get it into your brain. You know, I'm talking right now to your heart. I'm speaking on a heart level. In your heart, you are saying yes, and you're bearing witness, and the Holy Spirit is bearing witness. But then I'm trying to educate your mind to what you already have in your spirit. Boy, there's a big difference between that. I tell you, this has just transformed my life. This is a powerful truth that has revolutionized me. Just to know that you have the mind of Christ, just to know that we don't have to sit there and just say, well, we'll never understand it, this side of glory. Just to know that I'm not limited to that, that I can press in. Now, it's not without effort. It's not automatic. You don't have the wisdom and the knowledge that's in your spirit just instantly transform your mind. The Bible talks about this in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, where it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. That word transform there is the Greek word metamorpho. It's a word we get metamorphosis from. The way that a worm becomes a butterfly, this transformation takes place by the renewing of your mind, is what Romans 12, 2 says. And so, see, you have all of this in your spirit, but it takes a renewing of your mind. It takes effort. And going back to that first verse, Romans 12, 1, you have to present your body a living sacrifice. You have to seek after God. You have to yield to God. If you are out here listening to the trash, the sewage of this world flowing through your mind, and if you're occupied with that, then you know what? Even though you have the mind of Christ, this knowledge that all things that pertain unto life and godliness come through the knowledge of Him, and you've got that knowledge there, you'll never draw it out as long as you're sitting here using the entertainment of this world and the corruption of this world, as long as you are listening to the bigotry and the bias and the prejudice of people. And if you are being dominated by that instead of by what God's Word says, you'll never draw out this life of God that's on the inside of you. I'm telling you, we live in a corrupted world, and the, the opinions of people, our news media, just so many things are going on are contrary to what I'm saying. 
I'm telling you that in your born again spirit, you have the mind of Christ. You know Amen. all things. And the world is going to tell you that, no, you can't do this. It's going to show you that you are incapable. It's going to point out your failures. It's going to be doing all of this. And unless you make a deliberate effort to get into God's word and to renew your mind, this isn't going to come to pass automatically. Here's another way of saying it. It's as simple as what I'm describing right here. In your spirit, you, you're already complete. If you were born again, everything you will ever have in heaven is already on the inside of you. But to get it out so that you can experience it in your emotions and experience it in your physical body, you have to renew your mind, and that takes effort. So it's simple. But it's the hardest thing you'll ever do to go against the way that this world thinks. Most of us are just followers. Most of us let other people press us into their mold. Matter of fact, again, if you go back to Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, and be not conformed to this world. The word for conformed there in the Greek, it's a word that means to press into the mold of. And it says, don't be pressed into the mold. Oh, don't of this world. Don't be conformed to the thinking of this world, but be transformed through the renewing of your mind. Most people just, it's like sitting on an inner tube and floating down a river. That's what most people want their life to be, effortless. They just want to sit there and drink lemonade as they float down the river. I guarantee you the direction that this world is going, if you just go with the flow, you are going to go to hell. Or if you got born again, and don't renew your mind. You may not go to hell, but you are going to experience all of the death and the destruction and the heartache and the failure and the problems that those who are going to hell experience. I tell you, it's more accurate to say that the Christian life is like swimming upstream while everybody else is on their inner tube drinking lemonade and floating down the stream. Here you are swimming upstream, putting out a lot of effort. It's as simple as you just turn around and go the other way. It's simple, but it takes more effort to go upstream than it does to go downstream. What I'm saying is simple. You have the mind of Christ. Everything that you need is on the inside of you, but it's going to take all of the effort that you've got to renew your mind. You know, when I first started seeing this, when I first got this revelation, back in, uh, it was probably around 71 or 72, not long after that, Jamie and I got married on uh, October the 27th, 1972. And immediately, I quit my job. It wasn't the right thing to do, but I knew I was called into the ministry, and I thought if I'm going to be a minister, I'm going to just serve God full time. And we had a lot of financial problems that were caused by me. But the benefit of all that was that I just started spending all day, every day, studying the Word, writing things out. And I remember one of the things that I did, I had scriptures just like these that I've been using. We have the mind of Christ. Colossians 3.10, we have been renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. And then 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, we have an unction from the Holy One and we know all things. Verse 27, that anointing will teach us all things and lead us into all truth. And I took all of these scriptures and I wrote them out. I would spend uh, probably a good six to eight hours or more per day writing out hundreds of scriptures that I knew were painting a picture of who I was in the spirit, but I couldn't see it. It just was totally contrary to my experience. It wasn't what I had experienced, but it was what the word said. And so to focus on it, I would just write them out longhand. This is before we had computers and I'd just write them out. And then I'd go pray in tongues. I'd lock myself physically in a closet. Jamie and I were living in a one-bedroom apartment, and I would physically go into the closet, push the shoes out of the way, and get in there and close the door so that I could have a little privacy, and I'd spend two to three hours a day praying in tongues, saying, God, help me to get to where I believe what your word says about me more than what I feel. I felt totally inadequate. I was just dominated by my physical inadequacies and failures. And yet the word was painting a total different picture of me. And so I would study that word eight hours, 10 hours a day, whatever. And then I would pray in tongues for two to three hours, asking God to renew my mind. 
And I'm running short of time on our program today, and so I'm going to have to do this on the rest of our programs this week. But I'm going to show you and make a link between speaking in tongues and getting a spiritual revelation of this. But, you know, I did this every day for at least six months. I would sit down and study the Word, write out all of these scriptures, and then spend two to three hours praying in tongues. And I did that for six months. And if somebody would have walked up to me and have said, what are you getting? What is God doing in your life? I wouldn't have been able to tell you much. It wasn't, it wasn't explained to my mind. I was, I was doing what I knew to do, and, but on the inside, man, I, it's just like I was boiling on the inside. I knew that something was taking place, but I couldn't have communicated it to you. I couldn't have done anything. And then a number of things happened. I hadn't got time on this program to explain it to you. But all of a sudden, in one week's time, I mean, my understanding exploded. It's just like nearly everything that I teach today. Here I am 30-something years later, and about everything I teach, I saw it in a little capsule form. 30-something years ago after doing these things and praying in tongues, and I got a revelation of it, and I am still seeking out and learning and studying out and getting new scriptures and new ways of explaining and saying what I saw nearly 40 years ago. It was all on the inside, and there was just this explosion where I got little basic concepts about it, and I'm still developing them and understanding it. Here it is nearly 40 years later. Hmm. Did you get a little concept? Amen to that. Did you get a little concept? Did something hit you there? Was there a word? Hallelujah. You know, having having an answer for everything at the tip of your tongue. You know, the mind of Christ, I, I was going over this not too long ago in a different teaching, but, and I was trying to relate to the mind of Christ in the way Jesus was asked questions during his ministry where people were trying to get his ideas or his thoughts or the mind of Christ, understand it more. And it was a couple of times, but the one time that struck me the most was whenever he, they tried to trap him. They used words to try to trap him, really. They were asking him these questions, but it was kind of like, and, and, and I go relate, and I, we did this before already. We talked about this, very, but when they brought him the woman caught in adultery. Yeah. And when they, it, it, it's, it actually says he act, he, he, oh, he looked down and was writing in the sand as if he did not hear them. Now, you know, when you read uh, Psalms, it says um, Shayla. You know, it gives you that whole thing. Of, uh, is it Shayla the way it's pronounced? It's, it's, I think it's Sela. Pause. Sela. Shayla. Yeah, like pause. Or... Yeah, like a pause. And I, Sela. Sela, right. Sela, uh -huh. right? So Sela. To, me, to me, when I, when I, when he says we pause know. Pause and think of that. <laughs> yeah, when he says we know everything, I just. If, you know, before I open my mouth and after I open my mouth, I have to give a pause just to say, was that me or is that Jesus? I, or that Holy Spirit. I want to make sure it's that Holy Spirit I word, not my word. And, and I use that sailor, sailor. Um. As, as a pause. And I, and I think that, you know, what's the scripture that says, be not quick to lay hand? It, it, the whole thing of answering quickly or being so cocky that you have an answer for be everything. Be slow to speak, quick to hear. Amen. Slow to speak. So to me, 
I practice that because, you know, in my day, back in my day of arrogancy of the utmost, I thought I had the answer for everything. And there wasn't a thing that you could run by me that I wouldn't have something to say in a heartbeat. You know, just I jump all over like a chicken on a June bug, as Andrew says. I mean, I, I'd be all over it. And, and to me, I think this concept of and, – and, and look how much he meditated and wrote and thought for six months. He's talking about here this little example. I says, it just goes to show you that, you know, the renewing of the mind, and he says it's like swimming upstream. It's going to take everything you've got. The, the reason I think that is is because – Whatever has to happen, it's like that whole thing of wax gross where he talks about your mind, their minds have become wax gross, like where it's like you have these layers of the way you think. And to change and renew your mind, you have to take all those layers off, like, you know, and, 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 it, and it's going to take time. I, I mean, I didn't gain, I just lost 60 pounds. And it took me a while because I didn't gain 60 pounds by just eating one meal. It took me years to gain this weight. And to lose it, it took time also. I, but, I, you know, and to renew my mind, I didn't get this brain until 54 years from that I am now. But to change it and to renew it, it's going to take some time. And I think we need to be patient with ourselves more so than with others as well. I think patience, the, when patience has its perfect work, it's working not only for towards others, but towards yourself. I think you need to allow that, that grace that you need. As, as, and as you humble yourself, you get that, that even more grace, you know? And I really think that that's a process. So it, it, what he's saying here about, Getting an understanding that you have all knowledge, all understanding. Oh, I mean, you could get thrown back by that. If someone threw that at you and, and changed it from a word to like a weight, it'd be a couple of thousand pounds coming at you because that's heavy. I mean, to think that you have all knowledge, all information. I mean, that's, that's – so if, if that's coming, if he's going to throw that at me, to, to prepare myself to receive and to get myself to understand and to be able to now walk in it, uh, it's going to take some doing. And that's what I think he's talking about when he says these precepts and concepts, it took him hours, days, months, commitment, upstream bat. I mean, it's going to take everything. You Look, I, I'm – you know what it is when you are willing and ready to receive with all of your heart and use all of your heart. I think that's a key to the most important um, requirement. You know, even being discipled, God says to give this word to faithful men and women because there's a lot that's invested and there's a lot that's going to be required. And to, to receive this word, I think it's highly important. These are, look, they call these like treasures, this, this wisdom, this knowledge, this understanding. It's referred to as treasures. It's referred to as secrets that are being given. So I, as I take them and, and treat as such and, and, and admonish them in my, my spirit, in my heart, in my mind, I become it. You know, I really think the idea is to become it. You know, Jesus talks about that he was or is the word, but he also says he is love. And I think that we become this word, we become this love, we become, we, we, it's, a, it's, a, it's a substitution of who we are and who he is. I get that substitute redeemer thing, but we actually, you know, the, and actually, if you go back to the garden, when, when God told Adam and Eve that, you know, and told Adam specifically that he had to work 
work the land. That word work in the Hebrew means become. That's the, 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 that word is become. So this labor that we enter into is rest, this work that we, it, it's a becoming thing. And as we absorb these principles and these ideas and everything we learn through what he's teaching us here, I think it just brings us closer to the Lord and becoming. And that mirror, when he says we look at it, that's the whole idea. We becoming, we're becoming what God says we are. You know, we rightfully discern the word of truth because we studied to show ourselves approved. To show ourselves approved is to understand who we are, to know for ourselves who we are. And to get our identity as Jesus Christ. It's every good thing that I acknowledge that makes this whole thing effectual. It makes it communicate. And I believe that when we receive a message like this that's heavy, knowing every single thing there is to know, that's a heavy message. I mean, sometimes my humility in and of itself wants to never admit that. Because I would just say, I don't want to be responsible to have to have the right answer for everything. That's a lot of work. But the spirit that knows all things that's in me, hallelujah, I receive it. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll walk in it. And I, and I can know that that power that's come from on high, that's endued in with me. I, I can I can operate. In and there's I'm more than a conqueror. There's nothing can affect me. Uh, Praise God. I'm sorry I didn't mean to get out to preaching, but we only had a few oh, minutes. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord is so good, man. Is he Amen. good? Yep. He is good. He is so faithful. Have faith in God. He is faithful. You know, I celebrate. I celebrate. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I especially like the part where he says, get into God's word and renew your mind. I really love that part. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. You become the word. You become it. Yeah. You become it. Jesus was, yeah, Jesus was the word made flesh. Amen. That's exactly right. Right. We we're to be followers of him. Yeah. There's a um another teacher, and actually I'm gonna use this to close with. If you go to the website and you go down to the bottom, you're going to see a, a worldview section there that talks about different teachers. The last one is called Dan Muller, School of Kingdom Living. I don't know if you ever heard of Dan Muller. No. Well, Dan Muller has a ministry, a school. It's Harvest Chapel, School of Kingdom Living. And he has a... 51 classes that are like each almost two hours. So it's well over a hundred hours. And he talks about in his primary ministry is becoming love. That's what it's called. And let me tell you something. He has an awesome, awesome revelation. I think it's this very same principle. And I mention it because I put so many things out here on this website and lots of times there because when we go on to teaching on something, we only spend a couple of minutes. We only spend an hour. The reality is that all of these things, like Andrew was just saying, it takes what you have and everything in your heart to get it. It says all of your heart, even no, I know the plans are if you believe with all of your heart. Everything is with all your heart. So my heart, 
I can't give all my heart in one hour and then leave and then have the rest of the day with nothing, you know? So I put these out here. You have a whole weekend and everything. And the Dan Muller School of Kingdom Living, I guarantee you will bless your socks off. I put this on like when I get into the bed at night. I'll put this on like starting at like nine, ten o'clock and just play it. And I'll fall asleep sometime around an hour or so into it. But during that hour, let me tell you, it blesses me just to hear a word that is talking about how I can become Jesus, basically, and understand it in a to my to my it really just speaks to my soul in my mind. So as it renews that, it just connects with my spirit because what he's speaking is of spiritual things. So, and he's right up there with Andrew. He's, he's an awesome teacher. So I just wanted to throw that out there with the last minute or two we had to make sure that we knew that there are resources here to help develop these principles that we're learning even more. And you can't get enough. I know that... Um, we can't get enough of this because it's, it's more than we can comprehend. So we can just keep on going. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Anyone have any special prayer needs, prayer requests, anything going on? No. All right. We pray for this nation as we end up here, close out of the day after election day, looking at some of the turmoil and things in the world and praying and believing for the peace of those people's hearts. And we take this information based on how we know all things and the blessing and the word that Andrew gave it comes in and it speaks to our soul. And it speaks to us in a way that we renew our mind and our will and our emotions to a place where we can be spiritually minded. Hallelujah. Because that's life and peace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we pray for this country and we pray for each other. And for Jerry as well, who did not make it again tonight, who I'm about to call, who lost her sister in a terrible sudden car accident last week. And she's still, I'm sure, dealing with a lot of those things here today. So we're just going to lift her up and her family for that loss. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 All right, folks, we will sign off and we'll be back again tomorrow at 7. God bless y'all. Okay, see y'all later. Bye-bye.